today we're going to talk about English explorers. England is going to have its um, place in exploration just like the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the French. All of this is going on around the same time period, so just because we started with one group doesn't mean that they automatically went before the other, they blended together. One of the things, though, that you need to think about is that when exploration is really big for Spain, <coughs> France, Portugal, anything like that, uh, England is having some internal issues. Remember, we talked about Henry VIII. We talked about you know the issues with wives. We talked about the idea of uh, getting rid of his first wife, Catherine of Argonne, who was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain caused issues and then the result being that they broke away from the Catholic Church and formed the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Okay, and then later on we're going to have issues with, you know, who ascends to the throne and then, you know, you've got um, like Mary the First that's pro-Catholic, you've got uh, Elizabeth the First who is, you know, more Protestant and you've got all these religious problems that are going on and, and you know, struggles for power and things. So they've got their own problems. Our first explorer that we're going to look at for the English is John Cabot. Okay. Now that's not his, his official name. His last name's like Cabato or something similar to that. But the English have <coughs> Englandized it, I suppose, and uh, created John Cabot. John Cabot is going to explore 1497, uh, 98 that time period, and he's going to be exploring from Virginia to Newfoundland. Virginia to Newfoundland. One of the things that uh, you need to think differently when you think of the English is the idea that the English are in search of a route also to the New World. Or not the New World, I'm sorry, to China. Around the New World. They're in search of something called the Northwest Passage. They believe that because they already know, because of French exploration or Spanish exploration, that you have this landmass, you know, this really long landmass that consists of North and South America. They believe, or they're in hope, that uh, you can find a northern route. That by sailing north, they can find a passage there. Now, this could be uh, through, you know, oceans, or it could be. The idea that you're going to go along a coastline and maybe sell up river systems, and after you sell up river systems, you might find you know inland seas, or you might you know find some quick passage. So that was their goal. The next explorer is Martin Frobisher, Sir Martin Frobisher, and he is going to explore the island of Labrador. Okay, if you know the geography, how many of you know the geography of Canada? because you've been studying the geography of Canada, correct? And you know where Labrador is, okay? Okay, you know that Labrador is on, you know, for Canada, it's on the eastern side, you know, and as far as latitude, it's a higher latitude. So he explores there. Now, I want you to think of something. This next person is really interesting, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake, he gets along really well with Elizabeth I. Okay, she's like a, a, he's like a favorite of the court, that sort of thing. But Sir Francis Drake, um, he does something that I think is a little bit unusual and maybe not so pretty when you think of uh, English history. <coughs> Which country could boast lots of wealth because of exploration? Spain. Spain could boast lots of wealth. So what, is the, what are they doing with this wealth? What's the goal? Aren't you gonna? Where, you got, where did you get the wealth? Where'd you get it? The New World. The New World, and you're gonna take it back to Spain. Spain. You're gonna take it back to Spain. How could the English get wealth like that? What? Still from the Spanish. They had these. Uh, it's the title of Sea Dogs, Sir Francis Drake and the Sea Dogs. And the Sea Dogs were English ships, or in other words, English pirates, 
that fought against the Spanish to steal all the wealth. So they would sail around following the normal routes of the Spanish and attack their ships and try to steal it. Kind of the beginning stages of modern piracy. Does Spain appreciate that? No, Spain doesn't appreciate it at all. And it's going to be you know, a tense time for the Spanish and the English. A long series of rivalries, you know, will uh, will be here in this time period. Spain and England do not get along. <coughs> Our next person, um, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, he is going to try to start a settlement in Newfoundland. This guy sails over. He's going to uh, bring a colony and establish a colony, one of the first English colonies. But in the process of coming over, something happens and the voyage is lost. The ship's lost, he dies. His, his half-brother, though, continues. The idea that, that he's going to continue this endeavor to start a colony. And his name is Sir Walter Raleigh. And Sir Walter Raleigh, he helps to establish a colony on the outer banks of North Carolina in a place called Roanoke. Okay, and of course, a lot of times when we think of the word Roanoke, we associate it with Virginia. But in this particular case, the Roanoke colony is on those outer bank islands of North Carolina, present-day North Carolina. He sets up this colony, the, the settlement that is, and you know there are people who are there. There, there are men. There are women. And uh, hopefully, it's going to uh, be lucrative and successful. You know, one of the first um, people in charge of this particular colony was John White. And John White, you know, believed so much in the colony that he even had his daughter was there. Okay, his daughter was there, Eleanor Dare, and his daughter ended up having the first English child born in the Americas. And her name was Eleanor Dare. I'm sorry, Virginia Dare. Eleanor Dare's the mother, Virginia Dare's the daughter. John White and, and Sir Walter Raleigh, they end up going back to, uh, uh, to England. And, uh, and then, of course, during the war, there's conflict in, in England. And instead of them coming back like they normally would, it takes them three years before they come back. In the process of them coming back, they sail back to where the colony should be, and they noticed that you know, the buildings are destroyed, no one's there, and there is something scribed on a post. And it says Croatoan. Okay? Now, they were supposed to give some sort of message if they had to leave. Okay, they knew that. The story that's told is that, you know, the people who were looking for this, these colonists, um, that there was a storm brewing, something like that, and their ship had to leave so they didn't really get to look. Here's some of the speculation. Some of the speculation is, is that um, they died. Okay. Something happened. Some catastrophe comes along. You know, if you know the geography of North Carolina, you know that hurricanes, if they're going to get anywhere, they hit the Outer Banks. Also, the native population that was there, they could have been absorbed into that. You know, there are some historians who believe that, you know, the occurrences of like blue-eyed blind in the Indian groups there could have been the result of these people being absorbed into the colonies. Some historians also believe that it was, uh, it was all based on economics. The idea that they did discover that everyone had died. But if they went back and they told that everyone had died in this particular colony, then who would want to invest in other colonies in, uh, you know, in the New World? Who would want to go? So if they didn't tell the full story, it sounded better than the truth. 
me that kind of sounds interesting when you, when you look at it from that perspective. Is all of our history always written correct? No, and sometimes we take history and we, we bend it to where it works for us. A lot of those stories that you grew up on or I grew up on might not be the actual truth. Or the full story for that matter. So, as far as the, the colony of Roanoke, nope, it doesn't happen. It's gone. One of the things that helps perpetuate the need for a colony would be the idea that in uh, 1588, the English defeat the Spanish Armada. So they defeat this huge you know, global power. So now the English can really kind of jump in where the Spanish are leaving off. Spain, you remember I told you the stories about Spain, how Ferdinand and Isabella had daughters, and that those daughters, um, you know, in order to carry on the throne for Spain, it had to be a male child, so they were really more interested in trying to figure out who was going to take on the, uh, the kingdom of Spain. So that's a problem for them. It will allow other nations to get a foothold in the Americas when Spain normally would have explored further north and claimed more area. <coughs> But in 1604, peace is with Spain. And that's going to, this idea of peace is going to allow for more, um, more exploration, more colonization. Peaceful times allows for more movement. You don't have to worry about somebody attacking you. When we look at major reasons for English colonization, we look at those major reasons. One of the major reasons for colonizations was that eventual peace that we have with Spain. The peace allowed for more movement. You could build up economic, an economic base that's there. Another thing that occurs is population. Population grows in Europe. And because of that population growth, it allows for more workers. It allows for more colonists. But the colonies also create a funnel type system. See, in Europe, you know, you've got to think about land usage, and you've got to think about farms, or you've got to think about just people moving up the social status. You know, from being a low income individual, you know, to somebody of high class, doesn't exist. Extremely difficult to do. But in the new world, you could come over here and be a rather poor person, and you could attain some sort of high status because of your work. And that was, a, that was something that people really looked forward to. It allowed for movement. In geography, we call some of those things push and pull factors. And a push factor is something that pushes you away from the area. So the idea that there's unemployment in Europe there's lack of social growth. We also look at things like religion or political you know, status. The colonies allowed for those. So those push factors push people out of Europe. The pull factors were in the colonies and the idea that you could attain whatever you wanted to achieve if you wanted to try hard. So it pushed you out of Europe, pulled you into the Americas. So we looked, at, we looked at unemployment or economic opportunities, the availability of farmland, the idea of an adventure. We wanted something new. Okay. Of course, opening up different <coughs> markets. And the markets that we look at, also you need to think about the type of system that we're going to be using. The term is called mercantilism. And mercantilism is to where you have the, the, the new world. The colony. The colony, you know, you extract some natural resource from the colony, something that, that they don't really have in Europe. And you send that to Europe. And then the Europeans, you know, say you were, you were sending timber, something as simple as timber. And you're sending it to Europe. And they decide that they're, they're going to make a clock. So they make this clock, they load it back on the, uh, uh, the boat, and they send it to the colony. The colonist comes out, pays six times what it would normally cost, you know, 
exorbitant amount, but then it's, uh, it's sold to them, and then it's this constant cycle, mercantilism. The last thing on this one is the joint stock companies. Joint stock companies helped promote colonization because the government's not paying for these particular expeditions. It's people who are investing, but yes, but yet they want profits. They want to get something back out of it. Now I want you to think about for European exploration. I want you to think about the results. First of all, it creates a global empire. Spain, large expanses of territory. The English, you know, the sun never sets on the on the British Empire. And there's a website up the top that will help you understand that. The next thing is there's an explosion of capitalism. The idea that people are trading goods and they're making money. You know, everything is everything's great. Competition's good. They also have a revolution in diet. I've told you the story about the potato. The idea that the potato in Europe, you know, because of bringing the potato in, instead of feeding a family of four, I'm sorry, family of one, could feed a family of four. So that allowed for population to increase. Less people died because of starvation. More people were born. And because of more births and then that, that competition for jobs, unemployment, whatever it might have been, cause people to want to leave. The last thing I want to mention to you is the Native American population. The English treat the Native American population a little differently. They're the get out of the way type. They want them to not, they're not really trying to convert them so much, just get out of the way, move over. Okay, because when we come in here, we're going to bring our entire families, we're going to cut the trees down, we're going to plant crops, and we're going to, we're going to do like we did in Europe. The French, remember, didn't bring huge populations of their people. The Spanish didn't really either. They converted the Indians that were here. The English are bringing populations of people. Native American population. When they arrived, from the time when the, the colonists arrived to 1600, 90% of all Native American populations, regardless if they were exposed to French, English, Spanish, or any other group, 90% of the population of Native Americans in the Americas died. Okay. Died. They had perished because of the simple common cold, smallpox, malaria, yellow fever, all of those things. That's why when we get into things like, why on earth did the colonists settle in places like Plymouth? Well, duh, when you sail along and you've got to stop because you, you need something to drink, you need to make beer, is what they really were doing. And you look out and you see this place where there used to be a settlement, and now it's kind of not there anymore because all the Indians had died. You know, you're thinking, hey, somebody's already cut all the trees down, they've already done all the work, let's just stay here. And that's what happened. Do you have any questions? Okay, what time have we got? Seven minutes. Okay. I need you to go to this website. Go look at that website.